stuff or with fog? Just like the Facebook. Can we get closer? The fog. Yeah. Of Hello. Thank you. Okay. All right. Actually, I wanted to start real quick. So, quick poll. We're going to move in. All right, move in. Move in. You're a disembodied voice. Come on. Okay. Yep. Just a quick poll of the audience before we start. Uh, if you've seen Star Wars, just raise your hand. Note. <laughs> 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 <Nope. laughs> All right. So, if you haven't. Yeah. No. <laughs> and so, I'll, I'll introduce you to somebody who uh, probably has. You know, different in that sense right there. Um, we don't pick on them too much for it. But every day. So I'm trying not to make too many Star Wars analogies during the, during the talk. But um, Brandon uh, is going to do most of the presentation for us today. Uh, he, he joined Manage IQ and has done a lot of uh, infrastructure side. He's set up Foreman, is working with Foreman internally, using it for stuff. Uh, so he has a lot of great experience with the product. Um, over the last week or so, putting together these slides, we've spent a lot of time um, discussing it, um, initiated off of the talk that Brandon started on the talk, on the talk site. So um, it's, it's really driven us into a lot of different uh, discussions, different areas, uh, modeling stuff that will go into the slides. So I don't want to talk too much about it, but um, it, it's been an interesting discussion. It, it's really a uh, how to reevaluate a lot of things. So um, I'm hoping we get a lot of good discussion out of this today um, and see where it takes us. So, uh, Keenan and, and Brandon and I really kind of focused on what we're trying to get out of this. And uh, so let's, let's get going. So I'm Brandon Dunn. Um, as Greg said, I've been working a little bit with the foreman internally, uh, using it for some provisioning tasks and other management and that kind of stuff. So here's our presentation. Um, overview, what is the foreman? Does anybody know? Probably not, so we'll do that a little bit. Um, some of our integration benefits, some of the things that we want to get out of it, and then when we want to accomplish that. So Foreman is a tool that's focused mostly on system admins. Um, it's used for provisioning for bare metal, private cloud, public cloud, um, virtual machines in the infrastructure. Uh, it's used for automation of repetitive tasks. This is one of the things that Puppet's really good at. Um, it's also used for configuration and monitoring. So it's also a Puppet type thing that uh, the Foreman does. Um, it can pull in Puppet EMC to find a node character configuration using classes in Puppet. Um, it can also pull in Puppet reports and facts. So the foreman is like a, a configuration management system. It can pull all these things together and present them to a system admin in a usable way. Some of our integration benefits, um, gener generic bare metal provisioning. Right now we have a little bit of bare metal provisioning. It's mostly focused around ESXi. So we're allowing people to provision ESXi servers, join them to a data center, and start moving workloads onto them. Um, Foreman is a lot more generic than that. It'll allow you to provision Rev and all sorts of other operating systems. Um, they also handle some installation infrastructure, like IPMI, Pixie, TFTP, DNS, DHCP, all these other things. Um, they do that through the use of their smart proxies. They do configuration management, so they're mostly focused on Puppet right now, um, but they're also expanding into the world of Chef and other uh, configuration management systems. Um, they provide monitoring, in fact, of systems that are managed by Puppet or Chef. Um, they also do enhanced installation templating. So right now in our provisioning, we have the concept of kickstarts. And in Windows, we have, we sort of have a multi-file installation system. But um, the Foreman allows you to take a simple kickstart that we would have in one file in our product and pull it out into multiple partials so that you can make a more dynamic script that could apply to a, a larger audience of uh, systems. 
they also do, they pull out partitioning into its own template there. So our initial goal is to enhance our bare metal installation. Um, to do this, we need to implement Fortor Foreman as a provider in our system. This is challenging because we don't have any other systems like this in Manage IQ. So we need to figure out where do we store things like the Foreman provider connection information? Where do we put the Foreman's representation of hosts? Where do we put them? How do we collect dialogue things? Like during our provisioning dialogues, you need to select an operating system, a host group that you want to apply to this new host that you're provisioning, uh, partition tables, kickstart files, all these other things. So these are some of the challenges that we're going to run into. Um, so we're going to have to update our metal provisioning dialogues initially. That will allow you to select host groups and kickstarts and partition tables. Um, we're going to leverage Foreman to install the OS rather than having our own writing out to a PC server and booting up the server using our IPMI code. We want to be able to leverage Foreman to do all that. Then the second phase would be taking those same concepts and applying them to VMs and instances in the cloud. So we would have to update our VM provisioning dialogues to ask all the same questions about operating system you want, kickstarts, partition templates, everything else. And then we would use probably our best fit logic and some of our existing state machines to do the placement of the VMs and creation of the containers. And then we would call out to Foreman to do the installation of the OS. And once that's complete, it would return to our state machine to do things like sending emails to users and preparing for retirement and all that stuff. In the future, we want to do some more puppet integration and I guess more chef integration as well. We want to retrieve form and facts and possibly use them in the control area and automate area. Um, we're going to want to enhance our REST API so that we can have a place where Foreman can call into us and say, hey, this event happened, here you go, let's notify you guys to <coughs> run your custom automation or uh, your policies against that. And uh, this is a provisioning workflow, just a shortened example that we came up with. So it would start with the end user, they would be in CloudForm, in uh, Manage IQ, they would go through the provisioning dialogues, and select, make all their selections there, what they want to apply to this VM or host. Then it would start to go through our state machine, we'd go through our quota management, look at the best fit, and then it would hand off to Foreman to do the operating system installation. Um, and then once that's done, Foreman's gonna keep a record of this host and continue to apply its puppet manifests and everything else to it. Continue to manage the configuration of the host. So once it's done, it would also call, call back to us, or we would call to see whether it's done or not. And then we could continue in our state machine by notifying users, setting up retirement dates, and in the end, hopefully the user profits. Sure. Um, I think the diagram that Brandon drew really shows us that Manage IQ is more focused on the larger ecosystem. It's uh, more on the business uh, value and the systems across, where's the best place to put a machine. But a lot of the work that Foreman's done is more on making sure the operating system is installed correctly. Making sure, um, you know, exactly how you do it. Uh, this, this assigning a IP address before it even speaks to DNS. Or, um, heck, even on the, uh, sorry, uh, and then on the continuous management side, maybe they want to use Salt or Ansible or Chef or Puppet or who knows what you want to use. And that's the beauty is if, uh, this, this integration allows the customer, the end customer, to use whatever infrastructure they want. And also it allows us not to have to write any of that code. Because the foreman is, they're spending, they're a separate project. They're spending their resources on meeting the customer's needs, the system admin's needs, if you will. And it, then when we, and it allows us not to focus on more of an individual machine, more an ecosystem of the whole system as a whole. 
So it allows us just to get out of the weeds in terms of the individual trees. It allows us to focus on the forest, where to plant the forest. Um, and they, they do have a, a, a fit, you know, where we want this machine. I think they say it, it, it goes on EC2 and they just find a machine that's available in EC2 versus uh, we're a little more focused on which exact machine gets this. So it really allows us to get out of, um, allows us to leverage what they do best. And it allows, some people are very system admin. You have a machine, it drifts, and it's not up to date in some of the versions of the packages, and they get it back. If you're at a low microscopic level, that's really something you want to do as an admin. But if you take it from our view, we just want to make sure the cluster as a whole, which machines come up, which machines don't come up. That's something, just a higher level. It's something that's a little easier to automate, at least in the way that we've, we've written our automation engines. So I think that's uh, this. Like, you did a wonderful job drawing this up. I think this really shows uh, what we're focused on and allows us to spend our resources, or at least feel like most of us feel like we should spend our resources, and also allows somebody to, to leverage the foreman. And, and understanding how the two fit together, um, personally, was a little tricky. Because I feel like some areas we do things better. But then also finding out how we could really leverage and embrace the areas where a foreman does better, if you're focused on more of a, of a system admin perspective, and that's, that, um, that, that's really worked for me in understanding um, where we could plug in. And then also understand that we, we need to install the operating system, regardless, if we're not hooked up to foreman, we need to also. So it allows us a little bit of what uh, Oleg was speaking about in the previous talk, understanding where these plugs and sockets go. It's allowing us to, A, define uh, our own plug, on where we're doing it and where the foreman can go. And at least we have two different, two different plugins that we can mesh together to come up with a socket that it plugs into rather than just one. So hopefully if you have two or three, you'll, you'll do a better job at coming up with an abstraction here. Sorry, I want to start. Looking at this picture, um, it's a very nice diagram. Um, I think similarly, the, the best fit placement that's on there um, could be delegated to you know other community members like uh, VM Turbo or uh, Servo, um, and you know they, they can go into their own kind of uh, swimming lane there. Um, you know, and then you can just call out to them, get the answer based on their uh, smarts, um, and, and then kind of you know manage it. You can just organize the whole flow. It's really good. Yeah. I think all of you are aware of it, that best fit placement part is is done in automate today, so it's very easy from there to call out to an external system and then create and fill in other projects to be able to do that best pl place fit. Ah. Best fit placement. Um, what I wanted to point out, I know we put a host provisioning on the top here because that's what we were focused on, kind of our phase one when we were doing this, but this same diagram really applies to, to any VM provisioning as well, or probably a container in the future. Um, so it's it really is a generic slide of, of the workflow. Can you delegate? Can you delegate to foreman to install all the stuff, for example, or like to understand better division of labor between manage IQ and the foreman? If I want to take the rack of computer servers and install open stuff, where you will have controllers and compute nodes and network controllers, can I use this workflow to do it? So right now, from what I've seen of Foreman's workflow, it's basic, but their goal is to be able to take a rack full of computers and say, install OpenStack on this with several of these types of nodes, right? So we'll have to take that into account um, when we do that kind of provisioning. But that sounds more to me like it would fit into our service model than it would to an individual VM or host provision. So if you were to say, through Manage IQ provision the whole OpenStack cluster. It would probably be composed of, you know, a Keystone server, several those hosts, and right. So, so Manage IQ would be using Foreman to provision each individual host, but the whole right. picture would be the Manage IQ who will lead the like, division of labor. I'm trying to understand. So the Manage IQ would be the one who knows how what it needs to do for OpenStack based on uh, some script or some description? Well, so Foreman, you, you say, uh, you define what, it, uh, what does a host look like that has Nova on it. 
As individual folks. As in, in, uh, no, no, uh, kind of a high level. Okay. What, what, is, what is this definition of a, what are the role, what is the, give me a word, <coughs> uh, yeah, yeah. What, what kind of a category is this? What, mm -hmm. Yeah, what the configuration profile is. Configuration profile is what looks like. And so you, you would set those up for each, and I think it's the uh, power, power, power puff? The state puff. State puff. The state puff. <laughs> state puff. This state puff project is talking about what you are, is what kind of profiles, what kind of configuration profiles we have for each of the nodes together. Mm -hmm. So now that is something that is actively developed from the foreman side. And just kind of saying, well, you know, we're setting up a cluster. We need disk. We need network. We, you know, just kind of these general statements. And um, there has been good work on that just to state those. Mm -hmm. So now your next question is, okay, let's create some, like, let's create a rack. Mm -hmm. Let's allocate each of those uh, configuration profiles to each of these nodes. There are projects not using, uh, not using Manage IQ mm -hmm. that are out, no. and there are those that, uh, that we, could, we do have uh, services, which would do something like that as well. But the beauty of it is there are projects, uh, actually lots of different OpenStack projects that are talking about how can we define these profiles. And, um, and many of them are using Puppet. And so we can leverage that from the community. And actually it's not even probably even configured in Manage IQ. That's, that's what the foreman is doing is managing those aspects. And then we need to decide what works best for the customer, whether well, I guess in our case, we would probably manage so that we could place the nodes in the right spot, make sure they're all in the same rack or something like that. So, so it is really some teamwork. Well, I think one thing that we always have to keep coming back to when we do these design things is greenfield versus brownfield. Um, so you may have installations out there that already have a foreman installation and we kind of we're coming late to the game. Um, that's your brownfield, and in those cases, I could potentially see. If you're saying that Foreman will eventually have some kind of service catalog type thing, that integrating with our service catalog so that we would pass the work off to them. So in the Brownfield installation, they already have it set up, we're just going to call it them. Um, Greenfield, they may want to use us, maybe ours is more robust. So I think, uh, you know, allowing both or, or giving the flexibility to the customer with, is really key to all of this. Um, and like you said, integrating with our service catalog and their service catalog, I think would would be a nice fit. And that's kind of the reason why we're here for the next two days, is we're stating service catalog or best fit right there. I mean, we already have it in Automate. We already know all customers want to change this. We also know that that's something that all systems need. So a lot of people are implementing something like this. So this is a, an example of a, sorry, component service plugin, right? You'll, you'll hear probably everybody use every one of those phrases. It is functionality that a lot of different individuals are putting effort into writing. So as we're having all of these discussions for the next two days, hopefully longer than two days, um, that will, we will be just defining what are these components. And then uh, it would be nice if the community drives to say, here is some, some functionality that I kind of want to be more pluggable because I want to be able to leverage something else. And that's a wonderful conversation. That's what open source is about is so that the customers can actually, instead of us, you know, one person going in the room and saying, I think people want to compose it with this one. The open source community says, I'd like to reinvent this. Uh, and we, we, over the past few years, like listened to customers and said, automate, you know, we'll, like, automate is one tool. And most of the things we wrote automate about are the ones that <coughs> customers want to extend, right? So really quickly, actually, I want to address this question because it's actually since July, Red Hat is using <coughs> The foreman is the element manager for OpenStack. Okay. So, if you go through their Red Hat's training for OpenStack, you're going to get trained on the foreman. Okay. As opposed to PackStack. Oh, as opposed to PackStack. Right. You're talking about the uh, state puff, right? Yes. <coughs> Thanks. The foreman installer. Correct. Yeah, I think I think that that would be that would be an interesting thing to see how this would be able to hand off to the foreman installer or to the OpenStack installer, and then have it. Be able to make calls back and say, "Hey, this host was created, and this host was created, and this host was created," and let some of those, you know, some of these different communication points go back and forth. I don't know that it necessarily fits directly into a single host provisioning, but maybe there's a better, uh, a higher level thing to see there, and maybe it's, you know, I 
again. Not a single thing like this, but yeah. But that's um, that's what we are talking about. Obviously, we'll need some endpoints mm -hmm. to allow for better integration. But until we start running these initiatives, we don't even know. I mean, we have an idea. But that's uh, room for growth. Right? Um, have you been also thinking about passing information to foreman, like? Uh, you have this tag system, and you could actually push it down to form an form of parameters or something like that, because then you can uh, build rules on, on the public based on the information that you're, you're getting from Manage IQ. So that, that's a system that, that we embrace. We, we kind of uh, pull information from the CMDB. Uh, we have some special topics, and if the topic is attached to a machine, then some puppet classes prepare some, some specific rules for, for this project. So you could use uh, tags in Manage IQ to, to pass on information and assign puppet classes or, or whatever, or react in within within the puppet class uh, of the of the configuration of time. That that would be the possible. Yeah, I think that's important kind of guidance from the community with you know input from the community is really important. Yeah. Yeah, the, the foreman is um, Two different mechanisms, most of my knowledge is from this individual here, just to disclaim <coughs> here, um, that you are, uh, you give a, a generalized configuration profile going in. But when you're using the foreman, you can either use these generalized where you pick yeah. one or two, but you also have an area where you can add uh, individual uh, configuration profile items when you're initiating a host. That does seem like a great extension mechanism. They already have the ability to say, please enter your tags here. Also in the form, and you have the ability of a place to configure what each of those tags do. So it, it, I don't think we were, uh, initially, that's why we're having this conversation. Initially, we were thinking about just hitting the first three, as you saw on the slide, when he was talking about what we're asking for. But you know, maybe saying we want to pass in these tags too is a, a wonderful option. It wouldn't be that much more work. We, it's just yeah, easier if we know what we want to pass in. Yeah. Yeah. The, the problem we are facing, we have to to regularly sync in both directions uh, in, in order to, to to stay synchronized to have these tags because the CMDB is drifting and and we are drifting with with setting up new new servers. So th that has to be tight integration and, and working both ways on, on a regular basis or based on events. If you if you like create a new tag, then you would have to pass an event. Uh, so you create that thing on uh, things yeah. like that. It's, it's a bit complicated, but it works very well. But, but, and that's the dialogue. We have three. You pick the operating system, and then based upon that, you pick um, the host group and the Kickstarter host. Things. And these are actually driven based upon the operating system you pick. You also have the rest of the three you know, that are already there. So I think tagging is actually already part of the operating system, like the operating <coughs> dialogue. You can pick what tags you want to have after it comes up. Okay. And I could see taking that information and passing it along to Puppet. So yeah. like that whole kind of environment goes to Puppet and they can make decisions over there. Yeah. Um, but in addition with, to what he's saying, the reverse has to happen too. When we um, say something changes and we need to tell foreman that, hey, we want to change this tag or, or we want to apply this, instead of that tag to all these puppet scripts, we want to apply this new tag. Um, I think that, that's where the configuration management, like phase two, phase three kind of stuff is going to come into play. Yeah, I think initially just getting started with selecting a host group or something like that, so that you have a profile that you're applying to this host will get us something that works. And then after that, we can enhance how granular we want it to be, and if we want to be able to add specific um, tags to things, then we can pass that down in the future. Yeah, and I don't even think we'll have that much um, astray whenever you're copying data off of somebody else. You're worrying about that those uh, diverging adrift, I guess is what uh, the foreman calls it. We just have to know that that name exists. Same thing when we're setting up our RBACs in our system. We know LDAP has some word for, for the name of a group, and we know we, uh, we use our own interpretation over here. We don't have to understand the full implications of that. We just have to understand what the business means by that, and then pass that along, even if the members change and everything. So here as well with the tags, we just have to establish here are the code words we're going to call across, the vocabulary. When those change, yes, you need to do that. But at least I don't see the vocabulary changing of those tags as much the tag names I don't see changing as much as the implications of those. Mm. So I, I think the synchronization might, um, at least in this one particular case, might not be so bad. Mm. But 
We'll see. So the next is modeling changes. That raised a lot of questions for us. Um, we've started to talk about what type of provider is Foreman. Where does it fit in our current modeling? Is it part of an EMS? Um, multi-provider discovery of the same object. So when you have a physical host, it may be a VMware host right now, but it's also registered in Foreman as a host. So now you have two different sources of the same physical object. So now how do we tie those together and uh, how do we keep them together in our system? Uh, models overdue for refactoring, EXT management system was one of them that came up. Um, host and VMware template. Host and VMware template came up because Foreman calls everything a host, whether it's physical or virtual, and we have those separated into two different models right now. Who discovers the system first in Foreman and the SLS system? Right, so uh, when we do an EMS refresh on VMware, it pulls in all of the hosts, all the virtual machines, all of their attributes. Um, so we're going to have to do the same thing for the foreman. So when we do a, re a refresh there, it's going to also find a host, whether it's virtual or physical. And we're going to have to tie those two objects together. Um, so some of the problems that we ran into are, do we tie these two things together in the same model? And then when one gets created through foreman, it's created, but right now we have we use STI for hosts and everything. Um, so it's probably going to be created as the wrong subclass of a host. Uh, so we have to figure out how to manage that. And we came up with a few diagrams on how to do that. This was our least favorite. <laughs> <laughs> so we create a provider class EXT management system will come up because there's a lot of logic in there right now that's completely around virtual and cloud and virtual. It has nothing to do with other systems like Foreman. And there's also subclass configuration providers of which Foreman would be one. Um, and add a Foreman host for every host that it discovers and tie that to a computer system. And then take all of our current hosts and VMs or templates refactor that into computer system and subclass there. Because hosts and VMs or templates have a lot of things in common, um, but then we looked at it further and we said they have a lot of things that are not in common. So that's probably a bad idea to put them in the same tables. It's really tempting though. There's so many of these other classes that are tied off of both of them. You know, well it's a VM, it's a template, it's a physical host. It has hardware, it has an operating system. Yeah, I mean, the, the list, and you look at both of them, you see the, the active record model associations. And they're, man, they're exactly the same thing. But then you notice that there are thousands of lines of code in each. And this is something that, as you mentioned before, is kind of due for refactoring. So why would you take two uh, concepts you know, some people use the god object. This is the object that the whole system is based upon. Usually it's like user is a god op object, and then if it's a trading system, you do like order or something like that. And in ours, think about it, it's all about VMs. So this is one of the core objects. It, let's not ge over generalize this thing. I mean, this is, this is how we are providing benefit for the community, so you don't want to over generalize it. But I, don't, I, I think it's really tempting. <coughs> I did see Lee's paper, but yeah. Wait, did you say Lee's paper or did he say Lee's Oh, both of us. Both oh. of us think Lee's favorite. Both of us say no, but there is a definite drive for this one. And we ended up there. We're like, oh, yeah. So I can't remember what the titles were before on that slide, but uh, they were humorous. You don't want to go. <laughs> so then we came up with another model that I think we like the most in the long term, but it also introduces the most risk. So we would take the same thing on the left hand side. We would leave our existing host and VMware template. We would create a new Foreman host and we would tie those all to a computer system. We could migrate a bunch of the columns that are shared between 
things that are hosts or VMs or templates into this model. And then we could also move things like operating system and hardware and all that to be attributes of the computer system. Um, we like that the most, but it introduces a lot of risk with things like reporting and performance because now things where you're trying to report on a host and you have to go through this other table to get to the operating system, let's say. So it's going to have a lot of impact. Um, but it would also be nice to have a, re a relationship where you can say, get this host's computer system and look at whatever the operating system is or get go through the forming side and say, what is the operating system there and get to the same object. I think one other thing that, one additional thing that this provides, which may not seem clear from the slide, but right now I think we can't support multiple operating systems on the host, for example, because it's kind of intimately tied yeah, together. That's a we could potentially do that with this in the future. And, and also, we just said the host and the VM, it'd be nice if we could tease out some of that logic. And this is a, a beautiful, straightforward way that we could tease out one thing at a time. But as you mentioned, like, all of our reports, surprise, surprise, are about, not all of them, a lot of reports are about VMs, because that's, that's what we care about, that's our system, and the hardware that's associated with those. So you already see this extra hop that we're kind of adding to most of the market. Well, why is it worse if you guys add virtual columns to say the VM table or something like that? It tells you that an operating system, you have to go through the computer system to get to the operating system. Right, you know, uh, uh, Rails has through, has many through, so we could just, link them all through. But the problem is our queries potentially end up with n plus so ones and places. Well. That's, that's not right. really yeah, in that case, yeah. it's it's just questioning functionality risk or, or performance risk? Two different things. Oh, okay. so like things will break or things just will be slower? You're moving a lot of code around. Whenever you move a lot of code around, you have that risk in terms of introducing bugs. Uh, the performance risk we already talked about, I think that one's dead. Um, the virtual columns does allow you to run reporting, uh, but as it does today. I think we need as it does today. Yeah, I mean, there's virtual associations too, right? So there's that, but I think that might impose some uh, changes into the refresh as well. If we start inserting new objects in between, so that means all the refresh code has to has to change to compensate for that as well, which is doable. But again, the reason we put this one up here, we like this one, we like you know in the future to get to this one. But it's it's the risk level right now for you know at what stage do we actually <coughs> you know start moving to this? And the provider on the left is that just something that holds basically uh, an IP address and authentication or something else? Pretty much largely that. Yeah. yeah. Just so maybe it shouldn't be a subclass. Maybe it should just be some other kind of form of relationship. Right. Wait till you see the next slide. Oh, good. Really I'm waiting. Sorry. <laughs> it's our it's our plug-in provider slide. Go for it. Yeah. 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 Do you have a okay. risk slide? <laughs> 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 it's, it's, the, it's the blank one at the end that says questions. That's her. It's her least. risky sometimes. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, so the other idea was that we would move as much as possible that was common between all these things into the computer system. And I just leave this so that it's the EM, EMS um, representation of the host and its connection back to the. Um, Which, in the end of the day, um, if we have a pure inheritance model where our computer system is at the base and then these would be underneath it, it's the same model. Is we want to have something that represents all computer systems and then the power state functionality of those systems. And that's just a basic way of composing objects. So this is just realizing and embracing the fact that we think we need to tease out these objects. Because uh, God objects, I don't know if that's a common phrase, but when you have the user object, if people are developing, those things get thousands and thousands of lines long because user, you just have to add extra and extra, extra functionality. And that's just the definition of computer science in general. So you keep on having to pull out these abstractions to really kind of try to simplify. And we're just stating, you know, maybe it is time about now to pull out one or two of these abstractions. That, I don't think that's risky. I think it's, it's necessary. Uh, I just don't know if it's now. I mean, maybe we'll focus on Foreman and then we can focus on. Yeah, I like the right side of the picture. Uh, I think the left side needs some more. Yeah. Um, this also solves the problem of where it's discovered first. So if it's discovered in Foreman first, then Foreman can create a Foreman host in a computer system. 
and then when we discover that host is an ESX host and do the EMS refresh, then I can come through and say, okay, I'm creating a host record, but I already have a computer system for this and just create the link there and fill the blank attributes. And that's a good one. Uh, we had a lot of discussions understanding who owns this data. A lot of times it's, it's tricky when two different systems in charge of or two different software systems are in charge of creating the same object in the database. And if one of them had a bug in it, you don't know which columns are owned by which. So lots of times it's best if a single component is in charge of its own objects, if you will. So we've gone back and forth on whether the form creates a computer system or not. Kind of makes sense for to have it create the computer system, but I'll, also, I'll, I'll double talk on that one. It also makes sense for it not to, that up until today, the EMS VMware, let's say in this case, has been in charge of um, has been in charge of creating the computer system and this other hardware as well. So just want to add to that. That's actually it's mostly true, but we actually introduced. We already had that problem now with policing. So policing gets some of the same information that we get from the VMware, yeah. right? And they overload the same tables. So we have to make a decision as who has better information. Right. Yeah. And there's a lot of if conditions in the back. Would say, okay, well, vSphere doesn't really give me much information about the operating system, right? It just tells me it's Windows, mm -hmm. right? But policing tells me what version of Windows, you know, what patch level it is. I get a lot more information. So we kind of deferred one or the other, but we do it at the really at the refresh layer. Um, and I always hated that code. Mm -hmm. um, and going back to the risk, this introduces a third place we're going to get information. Yeah, we, from we discussed that exactly. So that gets a little tricky. Um, yeah. And trying to determine who the winner should be. And, and so, at a column level. In some of our models, we go by the column level as well. Yeah. Instead of, so at least a column is owned by one or right. on the other, mm -hmm. uh, which is nice, but sometimes like, well, this system, this column, it should be, take precedence versus this one, they should. It, right, and so if we introduce yet another master. And we might, may have to figure out, uh, we may want to think about that um, from the refresh perspective, at least. Maybe we need to put something together to kind of say, who, how to designate winners. In, in an easier way, like maybe a registration process. You know, when it comes back to the plug and providers, maybe that's part of that. You know, saying, you know, I beat this guy, <laughs> or, or I have uh, precedence over this guy. Yeah. For such and such problem. Yeah, so you need arbitration on multiple levels, basically. You need yeah. arbitration between the inventory collection and kind of the form of collect. Um, you're probably also going to need an arbitration layer between our fleecing technology and what form and things is inside the computer system at some point uh, to see if we can. Uh, one of the other things that we were afraid of on the first slide was we didn't want, if you refresh through Foreman, it creates a Foreman host. We didn't want it to create the VMware host. We don't know if it is the VMware host. It could be a rep host or something else completely. So we wanted to have a generic place where it could store those unique attributes that were always the same. is um, <coughs> uniquely identifying information. So it's an IP address, Ma a MAC address, seems like a common one that people use. And so, uh, and that, and, and it tells you the form and provider, so you know how to actually get that information. So it just is a stub, uh, which if you go to the previous slide, there was a form and host on the way to computer system. And, uh, so, here I'll kick the plug while we're at it. Um, the form and host is, it's the same idea. Uh, here, the MAC address and some of those other things lived in computer system, and that's the unique identifier. Because you have two, uh, the dedupe problem, you have two different people discover the same machine, you want to make sure that they're the same one. So in this case, uh, the uniquely identifying information is over a computer system. Uh, the next one actually has it uh, 
Yes, feels like it should be over there. Yeah, the, it, it is in the foreman host. So this uh, foreman host is actually a little bigger. It's got like two extra rows, but for the most part, it's just a join table. It's just a join table. And if something goes wrong with foreman, in this case, you can blow away foreman, set it, start it up again, boom, it discovers everything, and everything works just fine, which is nice and least risky. Also, though, we already said that the host and the VM template, we want to refactor those. If we end up refactoring those to get a computer system in there, that's the next slide. So this is just a, a, a stepping ground to there. You know, either do this, come on, do the work already, or let's walk slowly. Everybody has a different opinion. The thing is, if you, if you think about this and try to relate it to uh, the plugability that was discussed in the prior previous session, this seems to more naturally fall into that scheme because then you have independent things that could be pluggable and live independently from each other. You could have the foreman and have, it has its own host. And then you have you know, uh, hosts and the data templates from the infrastructure side. And then you have this process that says, you know, when I have both of these plugins together, this is how to link them up. That's the way they have the storage in the virtual infrastructure. Yeah. So it's, it, it seems to fall into that scheme more naturally than in the previous two. Uh, there's one downside, and I didn't realize it until Jason mentioned it, remaining on the same column, is that this assumes that the only thing Foreman can buy us is something that lives in Foreman. So say they do a better job at discovering the operating system than um, they made the fleecing. Impossible. Impossible, I know. I'm, I'm probably. <laughs> That's why I did pick the word fleecing. Um, if their data is better than ours, this kind of, this model says that they don't do as good of a job as we do. It doesn't really allow us to bring their data into our core tables as easily. Yeah, but then you could, like, say if the, if the information is more or less redundant, then you can have a, uh, an external auditor look at that data and make a decision as a separate. So we start extending form and post, which only had MAC address. But they do a good job of the operating system, so we'll add that column. Mm -hmm. And then they do also a good job at discovering the uh, packages that are in there. So we'll add that column. Oh, I guess that's what custom attributes are for. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. Cool. So custom attributes uh, are kind of like facts. I don't know if people are familiar with Foreman, but uh, it's a very... Uh, our, we want to talk about how our systems store <coughs> attributes versus how they do? I don't know too much about ours, but theirs are uh, just key and value pairs. <coughs> Um, so you can have multiple keys uh, with different values attached to a specific host. Um, and that's what we were trying to accomplish here. Saying that we don't want to create a column for every one of these things because it's unlimited really. Um, but we need a place to store all these things and attach them to that object. But the rest of our attributes are See, are more structured. Sure. I mean, this is uh, some things they call third normal form, which you know, the table says name and value. A dictionary. A, a dictionary. And we could do that for every single object in the database. So I mean, the actual table for us is advanced settings. Um, host and VMware generally both have many advanced settings. And we get, like VMware just has this unlimited key value pair that you can just get. Yeah. And you stick in, we stick in that table and then information can come off of that. Um, so, at least on this one, even custom attributes could probably stay on the host and the template as is now. But you still run the risk of if we know about it from VMware and Foreman, they got two sets of custom attributes or uh, advanced sets. Yeah, and we have it custom is, attributes as well, right, as a table, which also defines what the source is, where oh, the right. data comes from. So, yeah. So that at least allows us to difference that information yeah, as it comes in. Yeah. Once you lose that source, you can't, you know, you want to be able to delete things as they go away from Foreman, or, right. You, know, right, you need to, that's, to define that set. Um, yeah. But I think the structure and unstructured was kind of what you were getting at before we have, when we collect data, we, we kind of know where it's targeted for it, so we create objects and columns specific for that data. Right. Foreman just is collecting key value pairs, and you can create your own custom facts and collect your own data. And the um, keys aren't as normalized as so yeah. uh, 
common across vendors, so it would be hard for us to write a map of data to ours. But we want that data, it's important, it's, it's great <coughs> for policy or automate or whatever, there's a lot of uses for it. We need to get it in the system. But the mapping might be unique per vendor. Yeah. So I think it's it's critical to understand you know, the source of the data, you know, when arbitration when it comes down to arbitration, right? Because at the end, uh, if you think about you know users of the system, I mean, they might have uh, more of a say to you know I trust Foreman for this particular attribute, right? Versus I, I trust you know VMware for these other attributes, right? So we need to be able to have the ability to do that one way or the other, and that's that's the key part that we think is how in the system you're going to be able, based on your model, to get to that point. Right? I create a policy, I want to create a you know, format-based policy, I want to create a VMware-based policy, because the format will react to the event that is emitted by format, whereas the VMware policy will react to an event emitted by VMware, I would say. Right? So that's, those things are use cases that we're going to be facing. So I, I think you know, that's possible mm -hmm. based on the model where you can get that information, that's great, but that's, that's something that you may also want to be able to report on the existence of conflicting data yeah. for a given host. Or mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that's the fundamental use case. I mean, that's your point. I mean, it starts with, with reporting, right? Drift, data drift. How do I get to the point where, you know, I can make an assessment on, you know, uh, why is comment giving me one answer and then give more another answer? I mean, there might be some, you know, something else going on there. It should be given to policing the correct answer, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think part of that comes down to even timing. We, we Foreman is polling quite often, right? 20 minutes? Every 30 minutes. 30 minutes, 30 minutes to, to get the puppet facts in and then give you that information and we can collect that. We're fleecing, rarely are you fleecing the same machine at that same frequency. So if it's something you know, critical like that, then, then just the timing of the updates that you would get from the puppet facts would be it's not more of the thing, right? I mean, you you collect uh, you know VM power on, and you immediately you catch it real sure. time, right? So I mean, there's okay. missing, there's event, there's all those things that yeah, know, no, that well, I'm thinking inside, yeah, inside the inside. VM itself, right? <laughs> Obviously, container stuff. You know, once the VM's off, puppet's not going to be giving us much information. And this is the meat of the um, phase, probably even phase two or three, is that <clears throat> asking. Foreman to create a VM for you. That's great. That's not really using Foreman. And so, and that's and that's where the tricky side is. Is how do you deal with some of this arbitration? And we're also realizing we have some arbitration internally that maybe we could do a little differently. That would make it a little more scalable to multiple systems without lots of ifs, if blocks. And so that kind of gets us to wanting to leverage Foreman kind of in some areas <coughs> we want to clean up a little bit of our code to make it easier to add these plug-in points. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's neat. <coughs> Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, based on your three models, can, can you kind of talk a little bit about your know, thoughts around the implementation and gradually how you guys are impacting you know, these? <laughs> Next. I mean, well, go back to this one. I mean, yeah, I, I like this one from the plugin side that we were talking about, right? It separates them into different ones. So I think one. I like, so I like this one on the left. Yes. I like the other one on the right. Yeah, yeah. And we intentionally did it that way because we didn't want to end up with an end by end grid of different yeah, yeah. diagrams. Yeah. Right. So I think okay. like, uh, this one on the this one on the right, right? Yeah. But, but it's it's ex it's expensive. Potentially. Potentially. Yeah. Yeah. I'll do this. There we go. There you go. It's all better. <laughs> but, but we do need to, um, it will already be solved in Greg's talk later on today. Uh, we do need to find a way that these, oh, uh, we missed the um, <laughs> we, uh, we do need to have a way that we can, uh, the, for, uh, the providers right now, it's more of a give or take a single hierarchy for most of these. Uh, and the root common node seems to be the IP address and then the username and password to be able to access that. But you know the problem is what happens is there are multiple IP addresses for some of these other kind of more advanced use cases that I'm glad our community is using us so much because it, they're, they're forcing us into these really these more advanced situations. 
And here, there you go, we're trying to plug something in in a spot that we really didn't have that concept before. And also, a little bit, providers are these multiple components put together just because it's OpenStack. And now you guys understand my comment from, from last talk is we're trying to figure out how we can plug as many of these together so somebody can actually get the full benefits of all the platforms. So, yeah, we need uh, maybe a little loving over on the uh, EMS, uh, the extern, um, EMS external management system and uh, make a little bit of refactoring over the host and the inside too. Jason? Yeah, um, I know a lot of these model changes are more focused on the days one approach of getting um, bare metal provisioning. So, you know, originally form and host are mostly going to be bare metal, or that's what we're looking at. Yes. Um, and eventually we'll get to virtual, but, um, you know, the, the deep future was talking about configuration management as well. Um, and I'm wondering on the left side there, if that's focusing right now on bare metal, uh, I mean, I know you guys haven't designed it, but have you thought about is there going to be a third type for Foreman as a configuration management thing, or do you want to overload, or, you know, it comes back to the pluggability if you have multiple yeah. sockets to plug into. Exactly. I was talking about that a little bit during the last presentation, and Foreman really fits into two different sockets because it's a bare metal provisioning engine, but it's also a configuration management system, so we'll have to figure out how to associate that object with both plug-in sockets. Mm -hmm. and, and also it's uh, one thing if you know is your computer system, the host, uh, typically right now any of the EMS providers, a computer system only has one of them. Versus the foreman, something's built up on VMware, we know about it, or OpenStack, but also it has a foreman provisioner. So, up until now, the providers have had a single, like a, a single EMS provider, versus we're talking about, oh yeah, we also need our provider too. So this is the start of saying you can't just have one provider anymore. Right. So an interesting question to go from one to more than one.